I am out. I get excited about teaching you and then I forget about. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate that. Okay. Any questions on um, the dichord uh, exercise? All right. So let me just, because I didn't rec record, let me just do it again for you. Okay. So we can have it. All right. So let's, let's just practice um, threes and fours. I'll just play a series of threes and fours and hold up three for minor third, four for ma major third. Ready? Can't do threes and fours while I'm playing. I try to be consistent. Okay. So and then uh, draw the keyboard uh, on a just a piece of paper. Uh, if you have a keyboard, then you can just sit at the piano and visualize, right? But of course, if you draw the keyboard yourself, of course you're reinforcing that ability to um, imagine that keyboard in your mind's eye, right? And then do the tracking exercises of up a one, up a one, up a one, up a one, down a one, down a one, down a one, down a one, or have random numbers right down with arrow going different ways, and then you track where you are yet, and then you can start from different notes each time. Okay, so what I would say is start with um, a five number chart where you have directions, right? And then you start on different note, right? And you do that with like maybe five different notes, right? That same chart. Uh, and then that's your exercise for, for the day. And then the next day you, you draw a different num number set, right? So you, you get used to tracking different numbers. I would recommend starting with just ones and twos, right? If you become really comfortable where you're not really making any mistakes on with ones and twos, then you add threes and fours into the mix, right? And then you combine one, two, three, four. So um, your threshold of sort of uncomfortable zone should be you're making about three errors, right? So that's to, uh, that's about the extent of the border you, go, you should get to. If you're making more than three uh, errors, then you either slow it down or you take out an element so it makes it a little easier, right? So you can always gauge how, how, how far you can push your ability uh, by how many mistakes you're making. All right. So if you're not making any mistakes with just ones and twos, then you add, add three and four. All right. If you're okay with one, two, three, four, uh, with going directions, then you add uh, another interval. Okay. All right. So try to do these one, uh, at least you know three, four minutes a day. All right. So now we have the solfege exercises at three, four minutes a day. Uh, the dichord exercise at three, four minutes a day, right? So now you're having like a little bit of time that you have to kind of set aside. And what we're going to try to do is I'm going to add uh, a plate of exercises, sort of uh, so like it's like a building a calisthenics muscle, right? So as as you get more advanced in in physical activity, of course, if you take a fitness class, you do the same thing. You add, uh, you start with just uh, just bot, you know, without body weights, just your body uh, you know, push up, pull up, uh, sit ups. And then as you get more advanced, you get more, better in shape, you add more exercise to continue to push your body to become more fit, right? So in the same concept, I'm adding exercise for you to do. First, we start with the soul fitch, where you're not really worried about, about pitch content at all, right? And when we add the die chords, you're actually not worried about pitch content and, and the ability to hear. That'll come later, and it, it, it'll come naturally. After you get to, uh, for me, it was when I got to the point where I could comfortably name intervals one through seven, then it started to click in where I actually started to hear the pitches. I don't have perfect pitch, right? I wasn't born with that particular gift, right? But now what I have is uh, imperfect pitch. I can, given if you give me one note, then I can find myself where, wherever it needs to be, right? But because that's been, that's years of adding bits of time where I'm expanding the area, arena of where I'm un, uh, uh, un, uncomfortable, right? So this is gonna be a slow building process, but if you do it um, just like exercise, if you stop doing it, you degrade. Okay, all right. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, these are basically a four minute, five minute chunks, right? 
for the soulfish, for the die cord. All right. Then we're gonna add the score reading portion. Um, so uh, you know, work on these. All right. And uh, what I what I can promise you is that if you can consistently work on these, your ear will improve. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for now, uh, you should be spending like three three to five minutes on the soulfish, right? And continue to progress progress on the Dandelion book. Right, at least one line a day, right? If not the whole number, like a three line number, right? And then each day you're spending about five minutes with the die code exercises, right? Either imagining uh, the tracking or actually practicing playing different uh, threes and fours or ones and twos or whatever you're comfortable with, right? And in the beginning, you focus in on uh, just uh, um, uh, two of the intervals, right? So I recommend starting with ones and twos, right? Then you get more comfortable with that. You're making less errors. You move up to threes and fours, right? Once you get comfortable with that, then you do sort of at that point a combination of one through four, right? So you're mixing up playing the intervals of one through four, right? Then if you get comfortable with that, then you add in uh, the perfect intervals of five, six, seven, All right? So to the, and then at this point, I, I'd like to just take a moment and describe the the different intervals, right? So when we uh, see the um, uh, these die chords, right? We have uh, 11 sets, but they're also a subgrouping, right? So the, the, what we call a dissonant intervals are the uh, 1, 2s and 10 and 11s. So these are uh, minor second, major second, uh, minor seventh, major seventh, where the, the sonically, physics-wise, there's a seven cycles per second. It's the most dissonant intervals. So all four of these intervals, 1, 2, 10, 11, are called dissonant intervals. So they have a seven cycles per second, and it's a very vibrant um, uh, kind of a feeling. So if you had to draw them on a, uh, like uh, Marion Pilgrim does this thing where she draws them, and it's like buzzing all the way around the number. So ones, twos, 10, 11, it's all buzzing very vibrantly around the number. All right. Then we have the modal intervals, which are thirds and sixes. So your three, four, um, and eight and nine. Uh, and these are called modal intervals. And physically, physics sound wise, it's four cycles per second. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right. So um, uh, they're, they're very sort of uh, softer intervals. Right. And then you have the perfect intervals of five, six, and seven, which have two cycles per second. So you have these three groupings dissonant, modal, perfect intervals. And the perfect intervals have this one and two and three. And so there's two cycles per second feeling, okay? So uh, something uh, that uh, Marion Pilgrim used to do that's really helpful is she draws all the numbers with the particular kind of um, uh, physical sensation the numbers give. The dissonant intervals are very vibrant, dissonant seven cycles per second, all right? And the modals are four cycles per second, much more gentle, much more rounder uh, waves around the number, right? And then the perfect intervals are very straight lines, uh, two cycles per second, right? So it might be helpful to for you to draw the uh, 11 numbers uh, with the kind of uh, 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 color, right? And even within uh, each dissonant intervals, there's a contracting one uh, and then an expanding two, contracting uh, three, expanding four, right? Even perfect fourth. Uh, uh, to fa has a sort of downward gravity to sol and the, the perfect uh, 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 fifth has an expanding uh, to sol to fa right so it has this gravity well that it's in opposite directions right so it might be really helpful for you to actually um, imagine and visualize each um, uh, dichord interval uh, so you imagine one and two, so you kind of compare uh, the number one and two. They're both dissonant intervals, and you might draw a very uh, a seven cycles per second uh, borderline around the number, uh, but a different color. One is much more compact and darker, two is more, a little brighter expanding, and so forth. So, so if you could um, take the die chord numbers uh, and make a chart and kind of physically represent what that might look like. And I'll share uh, Marion Ploger's graph of what that looks like uh, once you have done that next time. Okay, so uh, for Monday, 
can you uh, can you draw uh, like one through eleven and interpret however it feels to you physically the dissonant versus the modal versus the perfect intervals and then within each interval uh, one versus a two what 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 the color difference is right uh, between uh, threes and fours and then between um, uh, eight and nine how that feels different than the threes and fours okay so draw that graph and I'll share what a Marian Plugger um, uh, rep how she represented that okay all right uh, enough on the dichords uh, everybody has a good good idea of how to how to focus though that four or five minute per day on the dichord exercises any any more questions on the dichords all right I'm gonna move on um, so I have a question about yeah. like when we are doing like the actual hearing, like are we trying to um, like figure out like the interval like directly? We know like what how many steps are between them, or are we trying to like figure out the like interval by telling like the quality of the like whole harmony sound? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So uh, when you look at the color red. What are you doing? Are you actually trying to figure out the pigmentation and the saturation point? No, you're looking at red and you know what red looks like and you're naming red. And in fact, that's what we should be doing with the intervals, right? We're making in a way too complicated, like trying to figure out uh, the, uh, we're not asking you to um, hear the content of that interval, right? We're just asking you to see, hear it physically. Oh, that's a two and that's a one. Right. So you have that's why it's really important to visualize uh, uh, not only hear the difference between one and two, but what it feels like physically in your hand to hold the one that's contracting versus expanding two. Right. Try to um, uh, connect uh, the difference between like a physical color, one versus a two. One's going to be much more dark or intense red than a sort of a lighter um, uh uh, more transparent two versus the one, but the two is going to be much more intense than a modal interval, right? So as much as you can uh, apply physical attributes to what that particular interval sounds like, right? Then it, the easier it's going to be for you to physically identify and hear and react physically. Oh, that's a one. Oh, that's a two. Does that make sense? So yeah, this yeah. this homework, this pre-process of really trying to visualize what one sounds like versus a two, what a dissonant for, um, interval ver sounds like versus a modal interval. Because if you really try to hear and feel the interval difference between a dissonant interval, versus a modal interval, right? Even if I play the dissonant interval piano, And the modal interval forte. Oh, sorry. The modal is going to be much more gentle because it only has four cycles per second, right? So what you're trying to do is um, identify the physical attributes that gives you a physical reaction to what this interval feels like to you, right? So that has to happen on the physical level, how it feels in your hand. Right, and then how you want to visualize the image of the different intervals, right? So that imagination work actually helps towards identifying these intervals in real time without having to think about where in the keyboard am I playing. Okay, so that legwork that you need to do, uh, trying to visualize the interval in your in your mind's ear, mind's eye, is absolutely crucial. Make sense? Okay, all right. All right, I'm going to go on to, so today what I would like to do is uh, two things. Uh, uh, Monday, you have the option of, and thank you, EJ, for reminding me, I gave you the option of recording either the Brahms Requiem excerpt or the Elgar excerpt that we're going to go over today. Okay, so we'll go over conducting, I, I want to see everybody do parts of the Elgar today. Okay, and then you have the option of recording one of those two by Monday, and then send me a video link. Uh, what about the Beethoven, Professor? Uh, the Beethoven, we're, we're sort of doing a score study. So I'm using it as a score study a tool rather than a conducting sort of exercise. Gotcha. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of Beethoven as well. Um, 
Uh, and then I also want to uh, start on the next excerpt, which is the Emperor Waltz, uh, which is a particularly challenging one because um, that involves being in one versus being in three and then transitioning between one and three, depending on what you want to do. OK, uh, and then I want to go over a little bit of how to write the next assignment, which is um, uh, doing a comparison uh, of recordings and writing a, um, a report on that. OK, so I'm going to go to uh, the Elgar. So uh, let's let's go to the Elgar. Hmm. Ooh, I'm running out of battery. Why am I running out of battery? Okay. All right. Uh, so even though uh, the, the Elgar score Here's the Elgar. Okay, uh, so what I'll do is I'll keep it um, here. If I keep it that way, then you can pretty much see the whole score, yes? I'll reduce the score a little bit. Um, is that too small? Okay, all right. So then what we'll do is, then I can go to the uh, recording, play the recording. Uh, but you can see still see the score. Yes? Give me a thumbs up that you see the score and hear the sound. Okay. All right. So uh, let's let's all uh, conduct through it. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I will, uh, let's do this first. Let's all conduct it through. All right, I'll sort of conduct with you. Um, and then uh, I, I would like to see each person individually in different portions, okay? So um, one of the things we're focusing on is how we utilize our left hand in this, in this excerpt, right? So we have many different kinds of uh, uh, dynamic things we're trying to show, right? We have one bar crescendo for a bar, right? Then we have um, places where uh, we have a sustained crescendo or diminuendo, but they're like, minor eddies of um, uh, different kinds of crescendos all embedded. So in a place like here, right, what, do you sh what are you supposed to show, right? Can you see my cursor? Okay, so uh, uh, in a place where you have mixed dynamics like this, because you have uh, the first part, even though the first three parts were together in this bar, in this bar, it starts to all, all be different things. So then what are you supposed to do? Like we, we only have two hands, right? You can't use your leg and uh, like that's impossible. So what you have to do is, uh, this is a kind of moment where you decide, all right, what is happening, what is not happening? So um, uh, if you find that the second violin part is not being heard because of the first violin, a higher, so even though the second violin part is the moving notes, and but they're lower, right? Uh, so maybe you have to pay attention to the second violin uh, swell in the third, into the third, third beat, fourth beat here. All right? Maybe the diminuendo in the uh, third and fourth part they're really not doing the molto diminuendo. Right? But in fact, uh, in somewhere like this, I would probably choose to um, show the second violin crescendo rather than show the diminuendo of the violas, because uh, by focusing your attention to the part that you want to hear. Right, you would like the audience to hear. Then the message to the rest of the orchestra is, oh, I would, uh, we're not giving much attention, so perhaps what we're doing is not that important. So there's already emphasis by choice of cueing somebody in, uh, so in this place, in this bar, where there are three different dynamics and three different groups, you focusing on the second violin, perhaps, might be the way to bring out the second violin line. Right? And then there are places where you have uh, sostenuto and tenuto markings. So how do you show that, right? You have an inner line, inner line here of viola and cello, where it goes piano to mezzo forte, while the first violin parts, which are higher, but they're marked sempre piano. So what does sempre piano mean? Always. Always, right? Why does why would Elgar write a sempre there? Uh, 
Are they just not as important there or? That's, that's absolutely right. Oftentimes, composers will, um, sempre is, is used as a way of sort of making sure the orchestras don't make the mistake they always make. So in a place like this, because it seems like, oh, we're going higher. I, I think this is much, this is, so the natural tendency of the violins here is to play louder, right? But the direction from Elgar is not louder, right? Here's a crescendo at 11, right? Tenuto. But then instead of uh, playing this figure, which is higher um, uh, uh, range-wise, uh, Elgar suddenly puts sempre piano. Right, knowing that they will out overplay this, right, and and uh, hide this more important secondary line, right. So sempre is used by composers as a way of reminding the orchestra, no, you are going to be loud there, so don't be loud, please, right. Um, so uh, um, and then we have an allegando marking here before the writ, right. So uh, I think. Some, sometimes a place like this, people can over or do it, uh, do too much of it. That it sort of, uh, by, that would cause the uh, retardando in measure 16 to be either, then they have to go even more because they slow down too much on the allegando. So you have to, is, is, it, is the allegando, do I slow down and then we come back tempo and then we retardando? Or is it an allegando into the retardando so it naturally evolves into the fermata? I think that's more organic. Sometimes uh, people talk about uh, your, your uh, rubatos are organic. Have you ever heard that phrase? Has anybody, anybody taught you, talked about that with you in the past? Okay, so uh, when um, when somebody says your rallentando or your rubato has to be organic, what they're saying is uh, they want you to make the slowing down or speeding up uh, physically natural, right? So in nature, most things don't uh, have a sudden acceleration, right? Those things are unnatural, okay? So most things in nature have a gradual slowing or gradual speeding up. That's, that, that is a, what, it's a natural phenomenon. Um, if you try to find something in nature that has a sudden acceleration or sudden um, uh, stoppage, it's really hard to find something like that. Right? So as human beings, we tend to feel things uh, um, uh, musically. It makes sense to us if it's natural and organic. So something like here, uh, da, 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 one and two and three and four and one. That's a natural organic where it's it's a gradual process. Something that would be inorganic or non-natural would be something like one and two and da di ya ta di da du do di and one. That would be something that would be really difficult to follow. Right? So if you're accompanying a soloist who has a natural organic, natural rubato, then it, it, it kind of becomes really um, uh, fun to uh, accompany because you can tell what they're going to do as opposed to somebody who doesn't have an organic rubato and then you have no idea how the next bar, next beat is going to slow down or speed up. Then it becomes kind of a terrifying uh, experience right? to make music with a person who sort of randomly uh, slows down or speeds up. All right. So as a conductor, if you try to do things in a way that's not, rubatos are not organic, then the orchestra, it becomes really terrifying for the orchestra because they have no idea how you're slowing down because it just seems random. All right. One and two and three, four and one. What? Okay. So uh, whenever you have alagando, rutadando, these uh, sort of rubato moments, try to make it sort of fold within a natural flow where it makes sense because you're gradually uh, spinning up or spinning down the tempi. All right. Then it'll it'll feel really natural. All right. But of course, you'll hear recordings all the time where they're doing a rubato that just seems like I don't understand what they're doing. Okay. All right. Um, uh, we talked about the importance of being able to hear that syncopated figure through 21, right? This uh, 20, 21, 22 in the uh, first part. Uh, we also talked about uh, the difference of 
Um, where are the triplets? Did they? You know, oh, no. I think in this version, like, there's an error, like, they eliminated the triplets and replaced that. Oh, one. I and see. Okay. Oh, they did? Yeah, that they simplified it, didn't they? Whereas in the Elgar, we have the triplet. Right, so it, it has both triplet and... Okay, well, okay. So I'll, I'll keep it on the preview uh, in the in this doc, and let, let's conduct through. Okay, here we go. Um, Our crescendo. Softer. Shandy. No, no, second beat. lines. And four. And. Can you through the fumara? Shando three. Okay. Let's uh, let's have people conduct. Who wants to go first? All right, Rehan. So Ryan, I gotta be able to see your hands, okay? Yeah. Here we go.
Okay, so let's let's talk about two things. Uh, one, I, I really do need your hands to be a little higher because when you go down here, and I, I like I see you sort of come up a little bit, but then I don't see two, three, four, right? So either back back away uh, from the camera a little bit so I can see your whole whole up, upper torso, and that we talked about that a little bit where if you're like like this, then I, <laughs> I can't really see your hands. Okay, so then we are sort of conducting this way. That that's not helpful, and we're forming bad habits. So try to be uh, in the up position, a little bit further away from the camera, so I, actually, I, I can actually see your whole pattern, right? And then in, in context of that, we we see your hand movements. Okay. Um, two, I think uh, uh, if we're up too high, right? Uh, we talked about in both the Brahms and Algar about this horizontal plane that we want to use because what we're trying to do is we're trying to really uh, be empathetic to the string players, right? Where their bows are not going like this, right? Their bows are actually so especially in 11 where there's a uh, sostenuto on those eighth notes and tenuto on b2 then you want to stay on that one tira tira one and two three ara. so you want to have the sense of horizontal playing you're you're shaping with your hands right so in, ter in terms of pattern think less about one two three four but more about what 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 does the string player do with their bow to be empathetic to that to that horizontal movement, right? Ta -di -ya -da, ya -da, right. So think think more on that. Okay. Uh, all right. Another person. Amy. One. Yeah, so everyone, when we get to bar bar four, right? It's been piano with a sustenuto, right? And a crescendi, right? So when we get to uh, bar four, where it's pianissimo, that's half the volume. So there has to be sudden, some sort of sense of architecture about that dynamic, right? So you can start more generously, maybe on the first three bars, crescendo, diminuendo, and then oh, pianissimo, right? So think about that difference that you need to show so that the orchestra reacts to your, your dynamic. Okay, Amy, one more time. Can you try to incorporate that? And one, two, three, four, and one. And go three and four. <gasps> one. Now crescendo. One. Three. One. Three. Four and. So one more thing that we're teaching through Amy, right, as an example. But bar six, we have a tenuto marking on B2 and a uh, tenuto marking on the eighth notes. So that's quite a bit more time. Two, two, three, four, and one. So you can take more time there, and the recording also is taking more time. So try to incorporate that one more time. Tempo. Okay, so Amy and everybody, bar seven and eight, it has this shape. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, right? So one, two, three are four moving trajectories, and beat four with the diminuendos, four, and four, and, right? Um, so Algar tends to do this a lot. He, he's a very emotive composer, but then he always says, oh, that, that was too much. Right, so he, uh, he says, um, uh, measure seven. Ah, oh, I love you, and then uh, maybe not. <laughs> I love you, and then ah, uh, too much. Right, so there's always this pulling back of emotion uh, in his music. All right, so bar seven and eight, it's one of these gestures where he gives and there's an ah, <laughs> and he backs off, and gives and then backs off. All right, okay, uh, one time. Hey, Peter, are you having internet trouble? Hey, uh, sorry, uh, I. 
my webcam for whatever reason just like was no worries we, uh, thanks to anyway, I had a kind of question about that part yeah. um, when you were mentioning the kind of um, diminuendo part yeah what is there like a um, underlying like mini tenuto on that too or is I think so expressive uh, okay yeah because I think well, on no on beat four so uh, on beat four know, yes we're looking at bar seven and eight where one, two, and three, yada. One, two, and three. So it's not, uh, uh, tempo doesn't stay, stay static on the one, two, three. It's not one, two, and three, four, and that's not it. It's sort of, you're taking money out of the bank on one, two, three. One, two, and three, yada. One, two, and three. So two and has this sort of forward moving momentum, and then four has sort of this back, back, backward moving. Right, Brahms does this all the time, where there is music that sort of um, it stays either it stays steady or it's oh it's it's moving forward, right? Or it's tira tira. It has this sort of so there's always this gravity pull. So if some it's in in slow music like this, it's even more pronounced the difference, right? Because uh, the the tenudos the the hairpins suggest that the tempo is not static. It's not staying steady. That would be the most unmusical thing to do in this moment, right? Di da da di da da di da da di da da. But in fact, da di da di ya ro di da da di ya ro di ya da di. Right? And then plus what they do oftentimes, ya ro ya ro. They would have like players in Elgar's day would have string players would have done a ya ro. Yara, this sort of glissed down to from the C to the G, right? Taking even more time. Okay. Um, and I guess my other question would be like, what kind of context would we eventually need to make an interpretive choice like that? Is it just like knowing the piece well enough that we can kind of make that choice? Or is it kind of just like knowing the general stylistic so, choice? I, I'm really glad you asked that because we can kind of go overboard with all of these sort of mini micro adjustment of Tempe, right? Because then you can kind of get seasick, right? If you're pushing and pulling so much, right? So which is why I think um, uh, I, I, I emphasize the point of organic, organically um, uh, um, phrasing that rubato so that it doesn't feel like all of a sudden, those two eighth notes doesn't feel like completely out of tempo, right? So we're, I'm talking about the push and pull that is still within the realm of we're not rocking the boat where the the people are like spilling out of the boat, right? We're sort of rolling back and forth in a way you can still get back to tempo, right? So di da di ora not di da di ta ya da da di ya da. That'll be I, I would I it would drive me nuts if somebody did that, right? So it's all kind of within the context of that bar taking pretty much the same amount of time, but how you go, where you push, where you pull back is a little bit different, right? And I'm taking license from the the hairpin. From the tenuto, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Amy, sorry. Can you go one more time? From the beginning. Two, three. Notice the tenudos on the quarter notes. Tenuto, four. Longer beats. Three, four. Take time. And go to when Second bar, a little more. In a voice. Three, four. Three, four. One. Touch two. In a voice. Four left. 
Now, what what the recording is doing? Very nice, Amy. What the recording is doing? It does no no before the formata, right? I think he, he uh, whoever the performance uh, decisions they whatever they've been stretching they've been stretching ever so slightly more and more so that the, that architecture towards the formata makes more and more sense. So the eighth note before the formata. La -da so it has the amount most amount of time they have taken right so i think this this excerpt has so much music that's packed in here that you can use to express and make choices right you can make choices about how much to noodle how much time you're going to take on each of the eighth notes right and then where are the places you're going to have a forward moving momentum where are the places you're going to sort of hold back right in tempo right so um, I would really encourage to sing through these parts, you know, uh, and uh, bar 12, 13 and 14, this, uh, this piano uh, crescendo to mezzo forte, the, what is the viola cello line, right? Uh, I can't remember how many times I've uh, sort of heard this piece on, on um, LP, CD, uh, Spotify, and then I never noticed that, right? And so when you start to focus in on inner parts, it really changes the, the shape and color of the piece, right? And like how many times have you listened to a, a, a famous pop song on the radio and you've been focused on the top line and then one, uh, and then one day you were listening and then you realize, oh, there's harmony there. And then you start to try to harm, like sing the harmony along, right? And how much that makes the song much richer, right? So that inner line, uh, and that ability to hear the inner line and track the inner line is really, really important for conductors. Because I think you, uh, for a lot of conductors, uh, you don't want to be the violin, violin section conductor, right? You don't want to be the, the conductor that's always just focused on the melody, right? Because often that, uh, the melody will have a different kind of energy in terms of pulse and um, uh, tempo rather than the inner lines, you know, uh, who have the motor, who have uh, the counter melody, right? So you have to be kind of be able to hear both lines. And often, most of us are better at hearing higher, higher melodies than lower, lower or inner parts, right? So focus in on your score study and being able to hear and sing the, the harmony, the melody, uh, the inner melody, inner lines rather than the, the violin line. Okay. All right. Who else? Somebody go from 11. Okay. Who's going to go? Rachel, why don't you give it a shot? I think uh, we're at 11 or 12 right now. Hello. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So look at measure 27, right? Up until 25, 26, where the, the energy is really slowing, right? It's not forward momentum. It's it's sort of holding steady, if not getting slower. And then all of a sudden at 27, it's a different energy. It's a forward moving, moving momentum. So it's really important to know where these uh, um, points of uh, departure is, right? So into 26, into the end of 26, your tempo is slowing, if not staying absolutely steady, holding that diminuendo three Ps, and then 27 downbeat hits, 
1 n 2 n 3 4 n 1 2 n 3 4 n yeah okay all right uh, can you uh, go back to this formata and coming out of it because this is an important skill so holding the chord you have to indicate to the first violins where the downbeat is right because they're holding the B natural into the downbeat right so if you wait for the A sharp to sound you can, it's gonna be too late it's your ictus that's gonna cause them to play off of that ictus into the A sharp alright so let, let's see that uh, I'll go back No. Yep. So, uh, ah. without the music, uh, Rachel, can you sh show us that coming out of that uh, formata? Formata. Bravo, everybody. Can you can you try that, please? Formata. Hold the formata. Bravo. Alright, Amy, keep going. I will play the excerpt. Alright, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll go back a little further. Four and one. Two things, Amy. Would you sing the the sec the second part line, and then conduct? So from bar twenty. So, and then, um, uh, it doesn't really have to be the right pitch, but now I think da di da do bi ba bi ba the first part from 2020. Ready? 2, 3, and 4. Yeah, so it's... It's it's really curious that you are not seeing the whole part, but ba ba. So it, you really you gotta be able to ba bi ba bi ba bi ba bo bi bi ba ba bi ba bo. And remember, I told you last time the way to practice singing this is to actually make, divide it into because you you'll get lost if you do it that way, right? So either every half note or every bar you you separate out the tie, right? So it sounds like this. So on between two and three, where there's a uh, slur on on where the tenuto note is on twenty and twenty one, or on the B flat in twenty two, I'm actually cutting that tie so I can hear the sixteenth. Right? Can we all do that? Can we practice that? Because you got to be able to incorporate that 16th uh, syncopated eighth note by the 16th note into your pattern. Right? Because ti da ti da ti da ti da ti da. That's going to have a very different different gravity well, where two three is going to be faster and then four is going to be slower. Three, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and which is going to be the tendency of the orchestral player playing that line, right? So you have to prevent that 
from going faster than the pa pi pa po pa da ti ta to pa da pa ti ta ta da ti ta. In fact, what Algar has done with the leggera marking, with the hairpin going to two, two b two to three, and the tenuto, right? He's telling everybody in the first violin part to take time there in the exact moment tia tia tara. So. The player who has a second line, that sort of counter melody, their tendency is to shorten the half note. So in that very moment, Algar's telling for the first five, I want you to actually take more time there. Right? So in fact, what will happen in an orchestra situation, whoever's playing part two is going to be early to beat four. All the time. Right? Right? So everybody sing the first part and conduct. And then tenuto. Wherever that's you see the tenuto or hairpin, stretch the tempo ever so slightly. Here we go. One, two, e and da, three e and da, four e and da. Da da pa 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 pi pa pa pi pi pa pa pi da pa pi pa pi da pa pi pa pa di pi pa 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 da pa pi pa pa pi pi pa pi pa da pa pi pa pa da pi pa 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 da pi pa 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 di pi pa 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 da da. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Peter. Let me see you conduct from the uh, from the fumata. Four and one and two and one and two and one and two And two and two. Two, three, four, and run. Bravo, bravo. Two, two things. You have to prepare that lagramente. You can't, you in the bars 29 and 30, you have to put use the tenuto, use the crescendo in 20, 30 to signal to the orchestra, okay, look out, we're going to slow down on that lagramente a lot. Right to the point where it'll give you room to go into subdivided eighth, subdivided quarters if you need to. Right, so everybody, let's practice this without the music. We're gonna go from 29. Ready and four and one, two and three, four and one and two and three and four and one and. Two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and back to four. Three and four and one. So what we really want to try to achieve is you have this really heavy eighth note feeling on the largamente of 31, starting from uh, B3. But you're really preparing even one two and three and four and one and two and three and four and and look at the second part right of of third uh here right da di da yi da di da and then two noodles of the third part ti ta ti ta ti ta ta in fact this third part is what you should really be focused on Right. All right. Okay. Now let's try that. Everybody together with the music, uh, and then Peter, I want to see you, you do it. Okay. 
Okay, we're just helping out here at 25. Slow down too much like this guy is doing. Back to inner voices. Um, Peter, comments? Uh, yeah, sorry, at one point, uh, someone walked into the room, so, <laughs> yeah, got a, just a little bit distracted, but, uh, I was able to keep, I was, I th think I was th at the right measure by the end of it. Okay. Um, through the Logamente, I yeah. did note that I think I went too long on the eighth note feel, um, because I was just really feeling it. Yeah. I was like, this is pretty good, I like the way this is happening, and then eventually sure. I was just like, all right. I need to transition back into quarters a little bit earlier. Yeah. So I, I think if you if you track the eighth notes in the inner parts, it, it makes it easier. Okay. But also, what you also want to keep an eye on eye on is this uh, fourth line, which is the cello part. Da da ti da ti da 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 ti da da da. So by the time you get to two and three, four, so that's sort of a, a really great place to transition into a quarter note pulse, right? Because you've been three and four and one and two and three, four, one and two, three, four, and, because if you feel that in eighth note pulse, two and three and four, and that's it actually go counter to the music, right? Da da three four, so that's this is a really good place to go into uh, that B three. Come back to quarter note pulse. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just wonder, um, what's your thoughts on the fact that the for the top two parts there are kind of like at this other eighth note interval, so that in the score it there still exists this eighth note feel, but yeah, I guess your point is that the cello part is really the prominent. That's, I think, the mo most prominent part, because if you look at the markings, it's tenuto, tenuto, and then sort of the carrot stick accent, mm -hmm. and then everybody else is diminuendo. So I think in that moment, musically, this is the most important thing. Yada di da, right? So it's kind of rising out of this sort of soprano violin uh, line as being, and then, of course, the dynamic is fortissimo sostenuto, right? So, uh, and the diminuendo happens much earlier, a beat earlier, in, or Three, three eighth notes earlier or whole, whole be, uh, two beats earlier for most, most of the other instruments. Whereas the diminuendo only happens after the cello reaches that highest G. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to move on. I think that, sh that should have given you enough sort of materials to be able to make a video on the Elgar if you choose to. Yes. So either the Elgar or the Brahms Requiem excerpt video is due Monday. Okay. All right, and I have five minutes to talk about the comparison. Um, so let me quickly go to um, a couple of files uh, and resources I'm going to give you. Um, so uh, if you if you're not aware already, um, uh, the San Francisco uh, Web uh, Symphony has a, an amazing resource called Keeping Score, and one of my uh, um, goals uh, in this course is to give you lot of resources in which you can come back to uh, to go further and deeper into study because there's just no way for me to cover all the things in in the depth that I want to right 
Uh, so keeping score is uh, uh, just, um, uh, I, I wish more orchestras would do this kind of um, uh, interactive educational website. Um, uh, I've shared the, the Bernstein archive in the New York Philharmonic, which is absolutely a treasure trove uh, uh, where you can sort of do really deep dives. Uh, but um, instead of just program notes, uh, San Francisco has interactive videos, historical things. Uh, so you can actually look at uh, not only the performance of, um, the only bad part of this uh, website is it uses um, uh, um, uh, Adobe um, uh, Flash. So uh, it, it's such a uh, awful uh, 90s remnant of technology that uh, I, I had to install uh, Flash and I, I really don't want it to use Flash because it opens your computer up to malware and all of that crap. So, um, but um, uh, it, it, it really is a, an amazing resource where you can um, uh, go into delve into uh, Stravinsky's bio, uh, the, uh, you know, um, uh, Diaghilev, who was the um, uh, person in charge of the dancers and choreographing uh, uh, and all of that. Uh, so, um, but then uh, you can also explore the score uh, in in various places. You can actually see the actual score. You can see um, the San Francisco Symphony play, right? You can skip to the next sections. Um, so it's a really great resource. Now, the only thing is just limited to one interpretation with Nelson Thomas and the San Francisco Symphony. I find the tempos are just on the faster side of everything. Uh, like this is very, very fast. So I find most of the tempos are too fast. Um, so uh, this is a way to sort of delve into the score, but I've also um, uploaded onto Canvas a um, couple files. Uh, so, uh, where'd it go? Uh, here, I've uh, uploaded a whole score. Uh, so you have access to the entire score uh, in, um, in Exploring Writer Spring, if you'd like, okay? Um, but also, I've also uploaded. Um, no. Ah, uh, 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 that's for next week. But uh, you can also. Um, no, I'm not going to show you that because I want you to actually come up with a graph. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me just go back out of that. Um, uh, so here's a paper uh, that. Um, ah, I just come out of sh sharing screen. Okay. Um, do I have that open in preview? Yeah, because so this is a paper um, by Erica uh, Buxbaum, uh, Stravinsky Tempo and Luxacre. But the portion that I'm interested in is uh, her. Uh, she collected uh, what uh, Stravinsky observed uh, on, in different recordings, uh, and in this particular recording. He is uh, looking at Boulez, um, Boulez's recording, but he has, he also in this section, um, uh, so Boulez 1, Boulez 2, uh, Meta, uh, and then S is his own performance, Stravinsky's, uh, and K is Carrion. So uh, what he does is, um, uh, Stravinsky comments on all the uh, five recordings and what the tempos are. And uh, this, uh, the marked metronome uh, mark uh, in these different rehearsal numbers section, and that's why I've given you the uh, Rider Spring score, so you can see what, what they're talking about. So the marked score by Stravinsky in the piece is 50, right? And Stravinsky himself goes faster than 50, right? Karen goes right on the mark at 50, but most, but Boulez 1, Boulez 2 in two different recordings goes faster, Meta goes faster. And then, uh, interestingly, even though his tempo was 54, Stravinsky uh, comments that 56 was much too fast. And then Mark's 52 as, ah, the, the tempo is good. And then uh, Meta's 56, ah, too fast, uh, or vitiatingly fast. Um, and then um, Mark's tempo in the Ritual of Abduction uh, section, rehearsal 37, is dotted quarter equals 132. Karian, again, nails the tempo at 132. Uh, Stravinsky's way too slow at 120, right? And then Boulez recording two, and Meta at 116 is uh, perniciously slow and sluggish, right? Uh, in the spring rounds, Mark tempo is 108. His tempo is 112, and he says, "Ah, oh, too fast." Uh, 
<laughs> so at least he's, he's observing that he was too fast as well, right? Um, so and, and so forth. So what he's going through in different sections and comparing different conductors and how fast they are. So um, uh, I'm not necessarily advocating that you do a similar kind of deep dive uh, into um, five different recordings uh, when you write um, uh, a, the next assignment. But I'm actually asking you to focus in on a particular aspect you can write specifically and compare two or maybe three recordings, right? Where you're either talking about tempo or you're talking about uh, rubato, like the issue we talked about today, whether somebody has an organic rubato or inorganic rubato, right? Rubato that makes sense, right? So you're gonna have to kind of uh, look around. Uh, if you want, you can just pick sections of the Stravinsky, right? Because that's, so in a way, some of the work is already there and you can actually go to the different recordings and compare and, and have your own take on it. So, for example, if you decide, you know what, I want to actually go and listen to uh, the ritual abduction and, and compare these uh, five recordings or find different recordings by Gurdjieff or um, uh, Gurdjieff tends to be really fast. Is that actually true? You can listen to Abado's recordings. You can do different conductors um, and Bernstein's recordings uh, Often, uh, um, he's famous for being too slow. Uh, the Elgar that we, we just worked on uh, this today, uh, there's a recording with the BBC uh, Philharmonic where uh, it's an amazing recording, but the BBC Philharmonic that played that recording said, oh my God, what are, what are, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to stand still? So there were so many complaints about that, the tempo he took in that recording session. Uh, the players who played it hated it because they weren't used to Elgar being that slow. Right. Uh, there's also a big controversy uh, regarding uh, Mahler, uh, Mahler V's Adagiero, um, where it's really designed as a, um, uh, a, a love poem to his wife Alma. So uh, at the uh, written tempo, if you follow Mahler's direction, it should take about seven minutes. But uh, Karian's uh, tempo takes 11 minutes. Uh, because he really used it as a, um, uh, it was famously used during JFK's uh, funeral service. So he really used it as, instead of a love note, it was used as a funeral dirge, right? So, but because Bernstein was such an influential conductor, that, uh, that recording uh, influenced many, many younger conductors who came after him, thinking that's the way you're supposed to play Mahler's Adagietto. Right? So there's a, uh, a whole slew of younger conductors who took the uh, Mahler 5 Adagero with sort of, they learned it listening to uh, Bernstein's version, right? Because there was the most famous recording. And then it became this funeral dirge rather than a, a love poem. So when I did the uh, Mahler 5, I looked into the score study and I said, you know what? These recordings doesn't make sense. It's, so I, I took it at uh, about the seven minute clip matching what uh, Mahler's in, in indication was. And people, in the orchestra, people like uh, we posted the recording, and it's like, whoa, why is it so fast, Chris? And so, and I, well, you know, I'm actually following directions of the composer. Uh, so, um, uh, this is a chance for you to write about different aspects of comparing recordings, because that's a skill you're going to have to have as a conductor, right? You're going to have to have come up with your own decisions about music making. You're going to have to be critical about what other people have done. Now, there's going to come a point in the score study process where you are ready to listen to other recordings and say, okay, now let's do research. Let's, let's see what Bernstein did. Let's, did. let's see what Mervinsky did. Let's, let's see what these famous conductors have decided to do musically, what tempos they've chosen, what rubatos. But once you have made those decisions yourself in your score study process, it actually is crucial for you to kind of compare what you have decided musically against other conductors. Right. So what I'm asking you to do in this assignment is you can either use Rite of Spring as a, a point of departure, right, where you compare two to three recordings, or you can do another piece altogether. Right. But I've given you kind of the, the first couple of steps where it doesn't become such a big process of research. Right. So if you want to use the Rite of Spring, great. Fantastic. But if you want to do a different piece and do a comparison of a section, um, between two or three uh, performances, that's fine too, okay? Uh, my advice is gonna be focus in on one or very small aspect of the interpretation, meaning the opening tempo of a section or a particular musical phrase that has a rallentando and how people 
choose to do that rallentando differently, that you can hear radically different uh, interpretation between two, two recordings, right? So my advice would be rather than do a whole movement sort of survey, because that would become a research paper, right? I would ask you to really laser focus in on the opening tempo and comparison between uh, two, maybe three uh, versions and talk about how they're different, right? Or talk about a particular rubato and three different performance versions, how, how differing they are. Okay, questions? So what I would ask you to do is actually uh, post the um, link to the two or three recordings you are comparing so that I can go and listen to, right? And, and this might be a, a assignment where I ask uh, another person to peer review uh, the, the, the finished paper, okay? Because uh, um, I, I do want you to uh, learn from uh, your colleagues as well, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it's due October 14, um, so um, it, it shouldn't be longer than uh, whatever number of words I said it was. I think I said, um, here, let me, yeah. So uh, it is not a research research paper. You do have to listen carefully to the two or three versions you're comparing, right? And you have to really know what they're doing. You should probably have a score available. Uh, if you look on IMSLP, most scores are available, right? So don't pick a piece that you don't have access to a score because you kind of need to know what the score, the direction of the composer is. Yeah, Rehan? Oh, uh, I was gonna ask, when you say uh, choose a piece from, from the canon, does that just mean any piece? Any piece, yeah. So you can use Writer Spring because I've given you the, the resource of uh, these different uh, tempo comparisons. Uh, also, the PDF of the score is there, uh, but you don't have to use Writer Spring. You can use whatever piece you want that you can find a score for and two or three different uh, differing versions. And we upload the YouTube links and the score, right? Yes. Uh, right. Score, um, sure, if you can find the link, yeah. I mean, the original score is what yeah. I was yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, we didn't get to the Beethoven today, uh, but I'm already eight minutes over, so, um, okay. I'll stay on if anybody has questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, is movement two of Lincolnshire Posey, like, is that just an R8 right one to go for? Yeah, I go ahead. My That's, band played it. That's a fantastic piece to do, because there are many, many versions, and people do it all different ways. So. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so I was just wondering, like, if the first assignment is already, like, did you already, like, word feedback? Because I didn't think I received any, like... Ah, uh, uh, I, I will get to it. Okay, I promise. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, like, it's still, like, in-review process, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye.